All right. Did you solve the solve all the problems about intermarriage and yeah, good. It's good. So we just move on. <laughs> no, no, we can't do that uh, responsibly. Okay. Um, so we yeah we're at this issue of the opposition. Um, if this is the goal, rebuild people's identity, and he's an expert in the Bible, that's going to play a key role. Um, but he hits on this issue, and it's similar. It's about uh, the, the boundary lines of the covenant people. And they are, they're porous in the sense of up to this point, it's been about who you worship, not what your ethnicity is. Although predominantly, it's been tied to the people of Israel, but there's been lots of non-Israelites in on the party. Uh, and Ezra makes this move, this interpretive move. He sees the boundary lines threatened. Um, he thinks, he discerns that this could mean the end of the covenant people as a distinct people. And so he sets in motion a pretty uh, clear and some would say severe boundary line uh, that he makes it about uh, race and, and marriage. So, um, what do we appropriate here? Um, and as I've read lots of different uh, commentators and people reflecting on this, um, there's one, the no stone unturned history nerd, Hugh Williamson, from the fat commentary that I didn't necessarily recommend. But I've cut and pasted his summary conclusions here. And I never, this is like bad pedagogy. Um, I almost never do this, like read someone else's notes. <laughs> but they're really helpful. Um, and I'll at least, I'll just kind of read and summarize, but I, I'm going to let him walk us through this issue because he could do it better than I could just talking out loud. You guys with me? I'm also aware of the fact that this is the food coma part of how these things go, which is food in our bellies makes, makes a little sleepy. So... Um, I'll try and be aware of that. We're, we're rocking till what, 3, 30, 3 something? 3 o'clock. Okay, got it. All right. Um, so here's uh, Hugh. He's a fantastic uh, Anglican British scholar. He's an amazing fellow. The treatment described in these two chapters of how Ezra tackled the problem of mixed marriages is among the least attractive parts of Ezra and Nehemiah. Let's just be honest if not the whole Old Testament. Responsibility dictates that we should endeavor first to understand the reasons that justified it in the participant's own eyes before we go on to evaluate it in light of scripture as a whole. So he's saying, let's put ourselves sympathetically. Um, and I, you know, just personally, when I, I remember the first time I read the story, the first thing I'm thinking about is, well, what happened to these women and children <laughs> that are instantly, right? And that's a very natural question to ask. It's actually the question that most modern readers ask. Um, but it's precisely because we live in a culture where group identities are uh, expendable for the most part. Um, group identities, aside from like your family, um, are mostly voluntary. You're a member at your church, you're a member at Costco too. You know, you're a member, it's just kind of like, are you with me? So we live in a culture that's fairly unique as far as I'm aware in the history of the human race that has diminished group identities that transcend the, your f actual family. Uh, and we're still f discovering the effects that's having on the sociological level. So that's for sure a big part of what's going on here and that uh, in their cultural setting was the main focus. So anyway, I'm starting, let's just, just let him say it, sorry. Okay, here we go. The Jewish community in Judah and Jerusalem to which Ezra returned found itself in an ambivalent situation, trapped between a political and a religious sense of identity. The edict of Artaxerxes, Artaxerxes that provided Ezra with his mandate was intended to encourage the development of Judaism as a religious community. Remember he got, go reorganize, and think there's Persian interests here. They want to stabilize the empire so that they last longer than the Babylonians did, which was uh, about a century. So pol Persian policy was, let all of these people groups have their own local leaders, 
um, rebuild their ancient religious identities, appoint their own priests, and, and they'll be much happier when they have to pay us heavy taxes every year. That was their philosophy. And so Ezra came, sent by this policy, to rebuild a religious ethnic community, which was somewhat different than the shape of the, the Israelite kingdom in the land in the period before the exile. So, he's uh, encouraged to develop Judaism as a religious community. That being so, the qualifications for membership in this new Israel had to be redefined. Otherwise, there was or there was felt to be a danger that the distinctive elements of the Jewish faith would be watered down, perhaps beyond the point of recognition by assimilation to surrounding cultures. So this danger was heightened by the economic power welded by some of those who are here labeled the peoples of the land. So think, think about this. During the exile, so many, many families are forced off their land to go into Babylon, and there's just land there for the taking for uh, people to buy up in their absence. During the exile, foreign landlords had apparently assumed control of a good deal of the territory, and the difficult economic circumstances that the returned exiles faced could have placed them at the mercy of their powerful neighbors. Against all of this, he has five points that I find really helpful. And I think they will help give you some handles on how to, to teach these, the story in your own setting. So first, the Mosaic Law was by now a constitutional foundation for this community. And lo and behold, there's no direct guidance about the central issue that Ezra had to face. Are you with me? So the peoples of the land, what do we do in this situation? We've never been here before. <laughs> Right? It was just different. It's a different sociological setting than the Israelite kingdom in the Canaanites. So we've never faced this, this problem before. So in consequence, he taught and the community accepted an interpretation of the law according to its spirit as he understood it. And, and I kind of had to go over it quickly, but if you, this little chart here where I just go through Ezra's words and you can see all the hyperlinks to the passages that he's adopting language from. And you can just see it. He's making a move that's saying the ancient Canaanites and the way that our ancestors related to them is what we need to readopt in this moment now with these people who aren't Canaanites, but the tendency to lose our identity because of these religious practices that could infiltrate us. So he does what he does. You can just see it at work in the passages that he quotes. Okay. So, he did an interpretation of those laws according to the Spirit. We may not agree with certain aspects of Ezra's interpretation, but his motivation and his method remain ones that we would acknowledge as valid today. Do you see the point that he's making? So, in, so we have the teachings of Jesus on marriage. Um, he had a very high view of marriage. And we actually have directions from Jesus and the apostles that um, I think would compel us to say what Ezra and Nehemiah may have been right in that moment, that is not what followers of Jesus, that's not how we're supposed to respond to a similar circumstance, divorce, namely. So, but the idea that we need to constantly be facing new cultural settings that raise new problems that Paul or Jesus didn't directly address. So what do you do? You have to interpret the Bible according to its spirit. So we adopt the practice of Ezra of reading and trying to think about what are similar circumstances we find ourselves in today uh, that allow us to take scripture from the past and, and apply it in today. So look what he says next. He says, we've noted in connection to the list of people who divorce their wives in chapter 10 that only the leadership of the community was involved in these proceedings. So it was mainly the leaders of the community. The survival of the whole stood no chance at all if the center became soft. And then this is an interesting statement I, that I found helpful. Israel's election was never merely for her own comfort, but so that she might shine as a witness to the nations for God and his standards. And he quotes here the calling of Abraham. Yeah? I'll bless you 
make you a great nation, covenant people, so that you can become a blessing to the nations. His point is that Israel maintaining its identity to be a blessing to the nations can't be achieved without maintaining a distinctive self-identity. And this was thought to be threatened by these marriages. Um, if you go read the hyperlink of this story in Malachi 2, which seems to be a contemporary text, uh, in some cases, the, uh, when Malachi, it's the famous line from Malachi about divorce, I hate divorce, says the Lord your God. So what kinds of divorce is Malachi opposing? Um, and some people think that he's actually opposing the decree of Ezra. Uh, there are other people that think what he's opposing, what Malachi is opposing, is all of the, uh, the events that took place leading up to these intermarriages, namely that these Israelite men divorced, divorced their Israelite wives and remarried the people of the land, and that that's what Malachi is talking about. And that's uh, Williamson's view. So even though it's not mentioned here, knowledge of this fact may have reduced the sympathy for the majority of the families concerned. In other words, again, we read Ezra 10, we think, what about the women and the children? And what Williamson's saying is, in light of Malachi 2, we should also be thinking, what about the Israelite wives who were divorced before they were remarried? Are you with me here on that one? It also serves to remind us that divorce was in any case regarded as in a rather different light than it is today when the church has its expectations of marriage raised by Jesus' high estimation. Here's another interesting thing. Ezra didn't impose his solution from above. Who, whose solution was it? Do you remember? That guy Shechaniah. And then all the people agree and Ezra's like, yeah, I think that's what needs to happen. So he may, in the meantime, have been teaching them his interpretation of the law, but the initiative for response comes from the community itself. That seems to be a significant detail in the story. Finally, it should be noted that no indication is given of what provision may have been made for these divorced families, the women and the children. And that's simply because the concerns of the narrative lie elsewhere. But this happens all the time in biblical narrative, right? where the question gets raised, the story raises some question that you are like, surely this is the question everybody's asking. Why doesn't the story ever talk about it? Why didn't God accept Cain's offering? It seemed to be a perfectly good, are you with me? And it's just the narrative has a different agenda. And so it just doesn't, so why did Moses get disqualified, you know, for striking the rock instead of speaking to the rock? Really, it's kind of harsh. Yeah. You know, and it's just the agenda, the purpose of that story isn't to answer your questions, it's to make a point that's very different than the point that you and I might be looking for. And so this is another one of those stories, which is the main thing that given our social location, the thing that we ask is exactly the thing that's not the priority here. Um, so what he goes on to say is essentially this, um, that up to this point, Identity and membership in the covenant community had been about religious allegiance. What God do you worship? And he says, he thinks that's the main takeaway that we still, as followers of Jesus, need to hear today. That this, this ambiguity of your neighbors um, within, when you're the covenant people of God, how you relate to your neighbors, you can't just drop a law out of heaven about that. Every generation, every culture, there's going to be different dynamics you have to navigate. And there are some times when, you, when the church needs to pull an Ezra and do things that will be viewed uh, as unfriendly, um, as intense or severe. But sometimes the identity of God's covenant people is truly at stake. And so a severe decision or an intense decision needs to be made. And welcome to every single generation of church history. <laughs> right? Really. So it's just the circumstances and the hot topics differ, but there's never been a generation without their hot topic boundary line issues. Um, and it's good to remember that. 
because we tend to think that the ones of our own generation, the generation we happen to be living in, we tend to think of as the, like the worst or the most intense form. Are you with me? And so, uh, obviously, all kinds of things in our culture about sexuality, gender, the nature of the family, the nature of human communities, all this pluralism, religious pluralism. Um, and there, we have to do the same thing. We have to do the same thing Ezra did, is discern, do it as a community, um, consult all of the scriptures that we have. For him, that was the Torah, and go for it. And uh, the results will likely be anticlimactic, <laughs> as they were for Ezra. But what more can we hope for this side of the new creation? You know what I'm saying? Is we have to discern what it means to be faithful and then do it. And we're probably wrong about however much percentage about it, but we just be humble. Are you with me? It's just, there you go. <laughs> there you go. Um, th this one's pretty clear. And I think uh, if you're teaching this in a community of Jesus' followers, you have to mention this. In the most analogous situation in which a Christian is ever likely to find themselves, namely married to an unbelieving partner, the New Testament, but, and he means the apostles, explicitly rule out divorce as an available option. In other words, if I'm married to somebody who's not a follower of Jesus, Paul the apostle really clearly said to the church in Corinth, yeah, don't divorce. Don't leave the marriage. That's a bad idea. Um, you guys know that passage? It's a very important passage. Yeah. So in 1 Corinthians 7, 1 Peter 3, rather they encourage a lifestyle by the believer of such a manner that could win, comp become compelling to win this person, to person over, win this person over. So here's uh, his kind of conclusion, and I'll stop. I'll stop reading his notes after this. So nevertheless, concentration on the narrow racist aspects of this passage should not blind us to the more general biblical teaching that for a believer to enter marriage with an unbeliever is likely both to endanger his or her faith and to weaken the marriage since they cannot share together those things which one partner most holds dear. This was the intention of those original laws about intermarriage in the Torah, and that remains true for the Christian as well. He quotes Paul's uh, line about being unequally yoked. Um, so, uh, does, at the core, does this story hold a message that's a really important thing to talk about in your church community? It totally is. Um, it just requires homework, and uh, there are some classes or sermons where you have to work harder than others to be super clear so that you're not misunderstood, and this will be one of them. <laughs> this will be one of them. Um, and to, to kind of give the background of the story, um, there are stories like this where um, in, our mod in our particular cultural setting, some stories just make everybody angry, and then they shut the audience, they shut the people in our churches down from being able to hear the really important thing happening there. Um, the story of Saul and the Amalekites is another one of these, where the whole thing is about his self-deception. He thinks he's obeying God when he's not. And that's such an incredibly profound thing to talk about. But the whole thing is that he didn't kill all of the Amalekites. <laughs> I mean, you're just like, oh man, really? Like that had to be the story for that point. And so you have, to, you have to, first you have to do a whole thing on the Canaanite thing before you can get to the, and so that's okay. That's just the hard work you have to do as a Bible teacher, but anyway, it's worth doing. So um, there is something to it where I'm going to say here, however you want to introduce Ezra, I don't know if that's a separate teaching or not, um, but I'm just going to call this uh, a boundaries issue, the boundaries of the covenant people. Um, there are times where those boundaries need to be really porous and open um, towards people who aren't, don't give their allegiance. And there are other times where the boundaries need to be really clear. And the Spirit uh, will be the one to guide different leaders and church communities to make the right decision in their particular context. How you guys, how you guys doing? I mean, I know that's, I'm trying to tie up with a bow something that's hard to tie up with a bow, but I'm doing, I'm doing my best. Um, 
Uh, Derek Kidner and Throntveit also have really good discussions, but I liked I like Williams too. Okay, should, should we keep going? Okay, hi. Yeah, yeah. Hmm. Well, <laughs> I know it. Yeah, um, uh, yeah. It's it's the first. Uh, if this one kind of made us ambiguous about the enemies and how they said no to those people and then generated the conflict, this one is really anticlimactic. Where it's like, well. What happened next? Like, what was the... And it could be a few things. Uh, it could be that the author, who's got a, a set of source documents in front, of, in front of him, and it could be he just doesn't have a source for what the aftermath was. That's actually the view Williamson has. And that could be the case. Um, I feel like this is a little disappointing for the literary ninjas. Right? To leave it hanging just because we couldn't find source material on what happened next. Um, so, so my hunch is that they're sowing the seeds of the, amb the ambiguity. That each one of these kind of ends with a huh. Hmm. Preparing us for the big huh at the end of the book. <laughs> right? So that's my, that's my view. Um, and we're back to that thing of even everybody had good intentions here. And the end result was kind of a mixed bag. <laughs> Which, that's like life, you know? Uh, both as individuals and in our church communities, isn't it often that way? And that, to me, that's part of the realism of the, of the story. Yeah. So can you talk a little bit about how, why Ezra and Nehemiah fits into the wisdom literature in line with Job and the kind of, the kind of difficulties of life for the wisdom literature? Hmm. Oh, um, well, it's not, among, it's not in the wisdom books in the sense it's not connected to Solomon or the wisdom tradition. Um, it's in this third section of the writings. Uh, and actually, the way Daniel, Ezra, Nehemiah, and Chronicles work together as a little triad is, is actually pretty important for how the Tanakh concludes. And I'll say a few words about that before the end of the day, because it's the ski jump at the end of the hill. Um, so, um, but it's not technically, or it's never been uh, associated with the wisdom books as such. Um, yeah, as a, as a short answer. We can talk, talk more about that afterwards if you want to know more. Okay, so we're cruising forward. Um, dude, dude, Nehemiah 1 through 7, oh my gosh. <laughs> um, so it's the third, third cycle of a leader commissioned by the king of Persia. He goes to Jerusalem on his mission, and here it's to rebuild the city and the walls and to repopulate the city. He meets opposition and then overcomes it. Um, so first of all, this is, uh, Throntveit pointed this out, that he thinks the whole of one through seven is this well-crafted symmetry and I was a little skeptical because I was like, really? That's a really... And so um, I took this one to the bank and r did this, looked at it all from top to bottom and it's really true. Like it's really remarkable um, that the stories at the beginning match precisely this, their corresponding stories like right on down the line. And it goes right here to the middle, the two middle stories both share this extremely rare Hebrew word uh, that's only used in these two ways in these stories right here. And this is often when uh, the literary ninjas <laughs> are constructing a story like this as a symmetry. They'll often make the most overt verbatim keywords that show you that that's what's happening in the middle stories because they're the closest together. And then once you notice it, I think their strategy is you're just reading first and you're just like, oh, yeah, that's, oh, oh, can we get, yeah, here we go. So when you're reading up here, and you don't know that there's a cool literary symmetry going on, you're just reading the story, and you're like, oh, why does that story occur here? What does that have to do with that? 
And then once you get in here and you're like, oh, weird, there's a prayer right here and a prayer right here. And why did these two stories use that word? And Oh, wait, oh, what? What's going on? And then you finish it. And then what you're forced to do is go reread it again and be like, is that what's happening? Yes, yeah. And so you get out here and um, Nehemiah's brother, Hanani, like he plays no role in the narrative except that he's just mentioned randomly just in the opening story <laughs> and just in the closing story here. And uh, anyway, it's really, really remarkable how this section works. Um, but there's a few themes here about uh, Nehemiah that I think are worth honing in on. I'll just talk about them and then I'll kind of throw out some ideas for maybe some classes or sermon ideas from Nehemiah. First of all, there's all these hyperlinks. If Ezra was the new Moses, there's all these hyperlinks between Nehemiah and Joshua. Um, so think you've got uh, the Moses and Joshua connection where um, you know, Moses led the people through uh, the, the sea that parted and so on. He anoints Joshua with the same spirit. And then what does Joshua go on to do? Does he also lead the people through the water? He does. Does he also have an encounter with the angel of the Lord where he has to take off his sandals? They both do. There's all these really intentional pairings of Moses and Joshua. Um, when you get into the book of Kings and you read the stories of Elijah and Elisha, it's the same thing going on where Elijah, does Elijah also go to Mount Sinai? Does he also encounter God and wind and fire and yeah, it's really it's brilliant. Um, and then there's this moment where he gives Elisha like the double portion of the spirit and then real quick, uh, Elijah crosses the Jordan <laughs> and then Elisha crosses it again right after that. So you have this Moses and Joshua thing going on with them, with Elijah and Elisha. And then the book of Ezra and Nehemiah is also giving you this pair. So if Ezra was a new Moses, um, Nehemiah becomes this new Joshua. And so um, he has this opening prayer. Um, we'll talk about the opening scene more in just a second. But he has this opening prayer. When he hears about the walls of Jerusalem, he has this incredibly beautiful prayer. And it's just a copy and paste uh, from the last couple chapters of Deuteronomy. It's just this beautiful prayer. You can tell his mind has been saturated in the Torah, uh, just like Joshua was, was called to do. There, once he gets into um, the city of Jerusalem, if you look at the, this is the outline of the story, do you see all these little double stars? All of those represent uh, what I'm calling uh, reports of opposition. And there's, it's seven times where Nehemiah is in the city. And, well, here, I'll, sorry, I'll just show you one. Here's the first one. When Sanballat the Horonite and Tobiah the Ammonite official heard that Nehemiah had come to town, it was very displeasing in their eyes. And then they build up their opposition. Um, where is the next one? 219. But when Sanballat the Horonite and Tobiah the Ammonite official and Geshem the Arab heard about it, then they mocked us and despised us and are you rebelling against the king? 41. Now it came about when Sanballat heard that we were rebuilding the wall, he became furious and very angry and mocked. Are you, did you get it? So, when so-and-so heard that this was happening, then they responded with some form of opposition. Um, can you guess, just guess how many times that little thing appears in the Nehemiah story? Just seven. Count them up seven. I did eight. I don't know why I did eight. Seven. It occurs seven. And it occurs precisely just in every other story pace. Right on through. And what's interesting is that um, this is precisely the same phrase that punctuates the story of Joshua and the Canaanites in uh, the book of Joshua. So Joshua enters into the land and um, they haven't, they haven't, all they did was cross the Jordan. And Joshua 5 begins, Now when all the kings of the Amorites beyond the sea heard how they had dried up the waters 
um, their hearts melted. Joshua 9, this is after Jericho. When all the kings who were beyond uh, the Jordan in the lowland heard of what the Israelites were doing, they gathered themselves to make war. So through, are you guys with me? Do I need to say any more? It's brilliant. It's brilliant. So it's a very s small technique on the author's part, but you can just see it's a part of his strategy for depicting Nehemiah as a new Joshua. And then um, in the Braveheart speech of Nehemiah, he has a Braveheart moment where like uh, Sambalat and Tobiah, they, they launch this rumor that they're going to do this like secret night attack on Jerusalem and all the people are afraid to work on the wall anymore. And so he, it says he stood up on the wall and he got everybody's attention. Braveheart moment. Um, and this is it. It's Nehemiah 4.14 is the Braveheart speech. And it, it's a... Uh, a quotation from Joshua's speech to the people um, and a quotation from Moses' words about what Joshua is to do once they get into the land. So come on. I mean, you guys. He's the new Joshua. What, the, what more? Do you, just, do you just need him to write it on the page? Right? <laughs> so they have. They did it this way. So you've got... Uh, so once again, it's the same thing. It's every generation sees itself as playing out some chapter of the biblical drama. That's awesome. Uh, here's something about these stories that really struck me uh, just in this round in the last few weeks of reading and, and thinking about them in preparation for today. And it's um, uh, uh, the Nehemiah story gives us a, a realistic portrayal of the internal life of a leader. And it's actually, when you look up, when you Google ne Ezra Nehemiah leadership principles, it's usually actually the, the Nehemiah story that people appeal to. And that's because he's really inspiring, actually. Um, what he goes through, how he discerns this divine call on his life, and the things that happen, the obstacles he faces, uh, the leadership strategies that he uses, it's really, he's wise. He's a good leader. And... Um, even though I don't think this is the books of Ezra and Nehemiah are a handbook on how to do your next building campaign or something, right? So don't use the book for that. At the same time, as a character, I think you and I are supposed to learn from him and reflect and meditate on how he led people through a very traumatic time of crisis where it once again seemed like their identity was at stake and everything was lost, and how he navigates people through. It's really, it's really an inspiring story. So, if you're going to do the Nehemiah story in two parts, um, one of them, I think, should somehow be like a character study. And I just have a few, uh, few thoughts in the notes here. A character study on Nehemiah. And the opening of his story, it's really dramatic and awesome. This is just from the opening, opening paragraph. The words of uh, Nehemiah. Ah, Nehemiah. Ah, okay, sorry. I'm getting ahead of myself. Nehemiah. Um, this is... So Nehemiah in Hebrew... Nachem Yah. Now that Yah at the end is always a shortened form for Yahweh. And Nachem is uh, from the Hebrew noun comfort. So it's either comfort of Yahweh or comfort, Yahweh is comfort. But comfort, comfort. Yeah? Nachamu, Nachamu. And then who arrives to bring Nachamu to Jerusalem? Nachemia. Nachemia brings Nacham. You get it? It's, it's good. It's really good. Yeah. But this is how biblical names work in the, in the Old Testament. So the words of Yahweh is comfort, the son of Chakaliah. It happened in the month of Kislev. In the 20th year, I was in Susa, the capital. And Hanani, one of my brothers, and some men of Judah came. And, you know, I asked them, Ed, how, how are all those 
Judeans that returned, le they left, they went back to Jerusalem. How are those guys doing? The ones who escaped and survived the captivity. And I asked about Jerusalem. And they told me, well, there's a remnant there in the province who survived the captivity. It's not good. They're in great distress. It's, a, it's like a difficult set of circumstances and reproach. They are, they are publicly held in low esteem by the people who were living there. And as for Jerusalem, the walls broken down, the gates are burned with fire. What is his response? He, just, he breaks. Now this is really interesting. Um, was this the normal response of every Judean who hadn't yet returned to Jerusalem? No. I mean, I think the reason, part of the reason why we're being told his story was he was unusually moved by this set of circumstances. So that's interesting. Uh, there were lots of Jews who didn't go, ever go back. Um, the Jewish community in Babylon grew and grew for centuries. They produced really important works of literature, like the Talmud. You've heard of the Talmud before. It was produced by the Jews living in Babylon. So lots of people took Jeremiah's advice and made homes and gardens. But when he hears about it, something triggers him and he just breaks. And it doesn't say why, but then he just, he delivers this incredible prayer. That's what I said. It's a copy and paste from phrases from the end of Deuteronomy. And look at what he says. He says, I beseech you, Lord God of heaven, the great and awesome God, you've been faithful to the covenant. You've been faithful and showing loving kindness to those who love him and keep your commandments. Let your ear be attentive. Let your eyes be open to the prayer of your servant that I'm praying day and night on behalf of the sons of Israel. I mean, why are we sitting in Babylon in the first place? Because of the sins of the sons of Israel. I and my father's house have sinned. And you're like, well, hey, he seems like a pretty good guy, actually. Do you see that? He's identifying himself with the sin of like his, his ancestors. We've acted corruptly, our whole family for generations. We broke the covenant. So remember what you told Moses. So that's a hyperlink to, let, let me just read and you see if you can remember the text that um, is being hyperlinked here. Here's what Moses said. If you're unfaithful, I'll scatter you among the peoples. But if you return to me and keep my commandments and do them, even though those of you who are scattered in the most remote parts of heaven, I will gather you from there. I will bring them to the place where I have chosen for my name to dwell. Anybody? Deuteronomy 30. So it will be when all of these things, the covenant blessing, the covenant curses that I've set before you, they come upon you and you call them to mind in all the nations that the Lord God has banished you. If you return to the Lord your God and obey him with all your heart and soul, then the Lord your God will restore you from captivity and so on. Yeah? Keep reading. Even if your outcasts are at the ends of the earth, from there, the Lord will gather you back. The Lord will bring you to the land your fathers possessed. He'll prosper you. And moreover, the Lord your God will do what to your hearts? Do you see this here? We're right here. <laughs> Where did Jeremiah and Ezekiel get the idea that God would one day transform the hearts of his people by the Spirit? to make them into faithful covenant partners that they haven't yet turned out to be. Where did the prophets get this idea? I got it from Moses. They themselves are developing this idea out of Deuteronomy 30. So just like the opening of Ezra uh, triggered all of this by quoting Jeremiah, so now this, uh, Nehemiah's opening prayer also <laughs> triggers all of the same the same stuff. And we're like, yeah, that's what we need. Return, rebuild, and the restoration of the hearts, the hearts of the people. 
So what he asks God to do, he says, listen, these people are your servants that you redeem by your great power. I beseech you, may your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servants who delight in your name. Make your servant successful today. Grant him compassion before this man. And your question is, what man? <laughs> like, there's no other person in the story right now, Just, right? And then he goes on, oh yeah, sorry guys, I was the cupbearer to the king, and I'm about to have a conversation with him. <laughs> Isn't that great how that works? He's a cupbearer to the king. He's an Israelite who's an official in a foreign land, and he's a cupbearer to the king. It's just reminding you of anybody else's story. Right? Joseph's story. Joseph's story. He is the cupbearer, has that dream about being restored to the king, and then he's the brilliant. Now, it came about in the month of Nisan, in the 20th year of Artaxerxes, that wine was before him. He's the king, you know. So I took up the wine and I gave it to the king. Now, I had never been sad in his presence. But the king said to me, Man, why are you so sad? What's wrong? Are you sick? Do you have the flu? This can be nothing but sadness of heart. And then I was freaked out. <laughs> and I said to the king, King, live forever. How can my face not be sad when the city and the place of my father's tombs is desolate, the gates are consumed by fire? And the king said to me, What do you want? So I sent a quick prayer. You guys know this? This is one of the most well-known parts of the story. Just in the moment prayer. And I said, uh, could I go back and rebuild it? And then the king said to me, queen was sitting right beside him, uh, how long will you be gone? And then the, pleased the king to send me. And so I gave him a time. And he basically says, here's the keys to the royal treasury. Have a blast. <laughs> And, uh, and, then, and then he goes. So uh, what's happening here in this story? This is a classic Old Testament story. It doesn't tell you what the main point is. You have to ponder and meditate. But think, so we have a character who the moment he hears about the desolation of Jerusalem, his heart breaks. And he, he, he's so um, bothered by this passion that's inside of him that he can't hide it, yeah? He can't, he, like, it's like Jeremiah keeping God's word in, like fire in his bones. He can't not do it, right? And so it's so obvious to everybody around him, it becomes obvious to the king. Now, how on earth, isn't it just what a coincidence that the guy who happens to be the cupbearer to the king is the one guy who has his heart broken when he hears about Jerusalem? And he can't hide it. And then what kind of king, what kind of mood does the king have to be in on that day that he's like, oh, one of my servants is in a bad mood. <laughs> and instead of like being bummed, he's like, can I help you? Let's, can we do some therapy right now? <laughs> right? And are you with me? It's really, it's so interesting. And then he, he just says, listen, the city is like this. And the king says, okay, what do you want? Let me help you out. And he like funds the whole thing. So... The story isn't saying it, but it is saying it. Who's really at work here behind the scenes? This is like an Esther type of situation for such a time as this. And like what Mordecai says to Esther, even if you are silent, God will raise up deliverance for this people from somewhere else. That's totally what's happening here. Um, and so this whole intro story is this fascinating exploration of divine, how providence works in the lives of God's people. It, it's when somebody's heart breaks for something inexplicably and then they meet someone else who just is feeling extraordinarily generous that day. Yeah, this is how stuff works. If you're in ministry very long, you know this is how stuff works. And no one planned it. This isn't any five-year strategy. This just happened. And that's remarkable. That's a cool story to tell. So I, this, is a, this is a great, this is, out, finally we get to like a feel-good message. <laughs> Ezra and Nehemiah, it's like a study in, in providence and in how uh, God 
can strategize things and align events to bring Naham comfort to his people in ways that they never would have imagined in their five-year plan. Come on, this will, tell me this won't preach. Yeah, it's good stuff. So it's, it's uh, when, and we kind of had this already, like what moved Cyrus to do, say this and what moved Artaxerxes to send Ezra? But this story really makes that the focus of the work of God's providence, orchestrating events beyond what anybody could have planned uh, for the benefit of his covenant, covenant people. And it doesn't always work that way. Does it all, <laughs> is this daily life? Like things don't always happen. They're actually really rare, but when they do happen, we're to receive them as gifts and steward them. And, and uh, so there you go. That's how Nehemiah enters the scene. That's my two cents on what to do with the story, what to do with a story like that. Um, the next part, you can pick multiple stories here. Um, but essentially how he goes about, I just kind of have some thoughts here, how he goes about rebuilding the walls, it's, it's all really interesting. Uh, I think showing his integrity and character as a leader. So he goes to the city and he doesn't announce his five-year plan. He does a midnight ride, like Paul Revere. <laughs> and he doesn't tell anybody, he's just fact gathering. Do you guys, it's uh, in chapter two. He just goes at night. He doesn't tell anybody what God's put in my heart. And he just goes and surveys the wall. He gathers tons of data. Um, and then he orchestrates a plan. Chapter three is all of these, it's a huge list of families that helped him work the wall. So you, Nehemiah's clearly been at work arranging a broad scale coalition, unity, all of the, this is the stuff that the Nehemiah as building campaign model, like that's, this is where this stuff comes from. But it's great, it's like actually in, in the story. Um, he, when Nehemiah uh, uh, faces opposition in these stories, he doesn't uh, view it as divine disapproval. Like he has, he makes his plan, he starts to launch it, and then we have all the opposition notices. There's seven of them. I mean, let's, let's say you plan to do anything in life and then you encounter two people that you've never met before and the moment they find out about your plan, they make it their mission in life to make you miserable and to thwart your plan. And you would be tempted to say, maybe this isn't God's will for my life. You know what I'm saying? We often interpret opposition as a sign of maybe I'm not supposed to be doing this. And he doesn't see things that way. He sees it just the opposite way. And he never fights with them. He doesn't launch a war. He just, uh, he does arm the people because they spread rumors that they were going to attack them. So the Nehemiah, they're great. They're great stories. Um, so if anything, this is about uh, providence. Uh, and, and maybe this is, this could maybe even be a little two-part mini-series about providence. Here's when everything goes great. <laughs> the story with the king and the story with getting the resources to go back. But then there are other times uh, where things don't go great and there's opposition. And how do you maintain a trust in God's providence in those seasons and in those moments? And these stories, especially in Nehemiah uh, 2, 3, and 4, are really cool for that. So uh, those are at least my two cents on the Nehemiah stories. How you guys doing? To, uh, this is my maiden voyage with Ezra and Nehemiah in a one-day thing. So I'm just kind of, you know, maiden voyage. <laughs> a maiden voyage. Uh, okay. Um, here's what I, I, oh, I don't have any more. Hmm. I don't have red. Um, okay. Here's one. Um, I, I don't think you're going to get nested, uh, but it doesn't fit nicely. Chapter 5 sticks out like a sore thumb in all of this material here. Chapter 5. And let's just read the opening sentence and you'll see why it sticks out. Because most of the Nehemiah story is this inspiring, yes, God's providence, we're going to trust him and move forward. Um, and then you get to Nehemiah 5. 
which doesn't tell you when in Nehemiah's period it happened. It just comes out of nowhere and says, Now, one day, there was a great outcry among the people and outcry of their wives against their Jewish brothers. There were some people saying, we and our sons and our daughters, there's so many of us, there's, we need grain to live. There's people starve, there's Israelites starving in Jerusalem. Some Judean Israelites have food, there are others who are starving. Then there are others who said, man, we're having to sell our fields, our vineyards and our houses to get grain because of this famine. Then there were those who were saying, man, we've had to borrow so much money to pay, ta to pay the Persian taxes <laughs> on our fields. We're now having to borrow money. And now our flesh is like the flesh of our brothers, our children like their children. We're, we're co-Israelites living in Jerusalem. But those of us who are poor, we have to sell our children as slaves to pay off our debts. And some of our daughters are forced into bondage. We're helpless. You guys with me? So you, um, here, we, you thought this was a happy picture. And uh, even though this was complicated with Ezra, this is all very inspiring. And so we think, yes, we're doing great. We're back in the city. And then you realize, like, no, there's famine. There's economic inequities, inequalities among the Israelites. And so some of the poor of the Israelites are having to sell their children into slavery just to make their mortgage so they don't lose their land. And they're having to uh, take out loans with interest from other Israelites. How does it make Nehemiah feel? It's angry. He has the same response that Ezra had when he heard about the marriages. And so, uh, Nehemiah, he cares about the Torah, and he says, what, you guys are charging interest on your loans to other Israelites? That's breaking the laws of the Torah. You guys, there's explicit laws in the Torah that says when we lend money to each other as Israelites, we don't charge interest. Remember that whole slavery thing in Egypt? That was, we're not supposed to replay that. Um, so, so then he goes on, and this is this whole example of how he sets an example himself. He says, listen, I was sent by the Persian king, and I was entitled to have a huge, uh, huge food allowance, and to pers he could personally benefit from the taxes on the Israelites. And he says, yeah, I didn't do that. He built a lean staff on a lean budget so that he didn't have to benefit from any taxes off the Israelites. And that's the story. <laughs> okay, so let me just, why is this story here? Why is this story here? Um, do we like Nehemiah? Is he a good guy? Yeah. We like Nehemiah. What is the state of the people? <laughs> so remember this was kind of like, oh, okay, I can see why you said no to those people, but man, that caused a lot of problems. And I can see why Ezra did what he did. Man, that probably had some negative consequences among the people. And then here, Nehemiah, we love him. He's incredible. And then we have the story about Israelites like breaking the laws of the Torah and charging interest. To, and you're just like, what? What's happening here? Why isn't this working? The leaders seem to be doing their the best. Why isn't this working? And that's right smack in the middle of uh, the Ezra, Ezra story uh, in chapter 5. So you finish, you walk away from that story and they finish the wall despite great opposition and you get a list. Once they finish building the wall, the, you get a list. This is, this is interesting. Um, chapter 7 is a long census list of the people who returned from exile. And if you're reading it and bored, it's probably because you already read this list <laughs> in chapter 2. The exact same list of the Israelites who returned. So, um, unless the biblical author is intentionally trying to bore you, which I swear they're never ever trying to do that intentionally, um, usually it's just that we're not getting what's going on. Uh, there's some, something going on here. So these two chapters act like almost like a bookend. 
of this section of the book has drawn to a con the return and the rebuilding has come to its conclusion through these three cycles. Every one of them has had high points and low points. Now we're going to get the two-part conclusion to the book. And essentially, it's going to... It's going to go like this. We're going to be really happy. And we're back. And we're really going to follow the Torah this time. And then they don't. <laughs> and then that's how the book ends. As are Nehemiah. But there you go. We've wrapped up our tour of the first three movements. How you guys, how you guys doing? Okay. Um, what time is it? It's 2 or 9. How, how, post-lunch food coma. Should we take a quick potty break? What do you think? <laughs>